Good morning. My name is Josh. I'm the kids pastor here. Uh, so what a fun day to preach uh, while we got to do child dedications. So uh, pretty excited about that. So I thought it would be great if I could give all of you dads a pro tip. All right. So I uh, I have two kids. Uh, they are almost four and almost two, so about three and a half, and then our two-year-old will be two, like, in two weeks. And so um, I, I thought it would be good. I enjoy cooking, and so I was like, man, I really would kind of, like, want my kids to start cooking so that then they can just cook for me, you know, like if I could teach them the right way to do it. But I thought, where do we start with a two-and-a-half-year-old? And so here's a picture of my daughter. Uh, we started we started, uh, this was a, about a little more than a year ago, but, but we started, and I was like, let's make some jello. You know, like, jello's easy, watch out for the boiling water, like, that's really the only danger. And then you just make some jello, you mix in the packet, and you're done. You know, you put it in the tray, easy thing to cook with your kids. So, pro tip, parents, uh, if you want to have a good time, make jello. Here's also a negative to making jello, is your child doesn't understand time. See this beautiful two and a half year old, she has no clue that when I take that tray and I then put it into the fridge, she's like, can we eat it? I'm like, yeah, in a little while. But can we eat it? Yes, you can, but in a couple hours. Like, it's got to get hard, you know, it's got to do all the gelatining things that science does, you know, like it's got to get to become jello. Right now it's just liquid, so you have to wait and try explaining time to a two-year-old. I mean, if we're honest, if we didn't really want to shame everybody, if I said, look to the person next to you and explain time, like, hmm, let me Google it real quick, right? Like, it's just tough to explain time, and it's, it's hard for her to understand that that, you know, Jell-O is going to go into the fridge. But the reality is, is if we make Jell-O now, she understands that there's this intermittent period where she has to wait a little while. And, and I love the end of this section um, because we've been in John chapter 13 through 16 for a while And I just love the truth behind it and the the genuineness behind it because you would think if John was writing about himself, he would maybe put himself in a little bit better light. You know, like that he would like, oh, we get it. Like, we really understand things. Like, this is, oh, yeah, we totally are great. We, uh, the disciples have no clue about what's about to take place. Jesus is going to go to the cross, he's going to endure suffering, and then there's going to be a resurrection. But they have no framework for a Messiah that's going to do that. They think they know what the Messiah should be and what the Messiah should do. They think they know what the Savior of the world is like. But the reality is, is that they have like this veil and they don't know it until they experience it. And so a lot of these truths that we just read in John 16, 16 through 33, a lot of them to the reader, right? Like who's John writing to? John is writing to people post-resurrection. He's writing to them so that they might know the good news about Jesus. He's writing to them that they might believe in Christ's name. And they understand a little bit of the historical events that John is claiming that Jesus is alive. And so when we read these, we're like, yeah, that makes sense. Because we're post-resurrection. And this morning, what I want to do is I kind of want to take a time because the disciples don't understand what a little while means, but we understand that it meant that Jesus would see them again after the resurrection. And a lot of these truths make sense in light of the resurrection. So I want to unpack three truths about kind of what we find here. But before I do that, I want to pray for us. And so let's pray together. Father God, I thank you so much uh, for your goodness. I thank you for your grace. But also I just thank Thank you for, Lord Jesus, how you are patient and how you answer the disciples' questions and how it reveals to us the goodness of God and the truths of God and your will. And so I pray this morning that you would fill us with your spirit, that you would lead us in all truth. Uh, And God, give me the words to say. Pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so they have this discussion about a little while. They don't understand kind of like what Jesus is getting at. They have no clue about time, and he thinks he's just like maybe a riddle or something. What is he saying? And this is not the first time that they're misunderstanding him in this long section. Um, And so then Jesus lovingly gives them a response, and I want to look at that response with you this morning. Uh, So it's in verse 20, if you have your Bibles. Verse 20, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament but the world will rejoice. Throughout all of this text, uh, all these verses, there's kind of like this great reversal that's going to take place. At the moment, the disciples will weep and lament, and the world will rejoice in victory. But then after the resurrection, there will be kind of a reversal. 
there will be joy, he says, for the disciples. He says, you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. I love that it's just a fact. Like, you will be sorrowful. Jesus doesn't tell them, like, hey, don't be sorrowful, because it's going to be all okay. Like, he understands the experience that they're about to go through. There's a, a component of all of this text that Jesus is, like, the best pastor ever. He's going to hit them with all the truth, but then he's also going to reveal to them all the goodness of God and the promises of God that are true in light of the resurrection. And then after the resurrection, they might think back on this talk with them and go, oh, yeah, that makes sense now. That's great. Amen. Keep reading with me. Verse 21, it says, When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. It's kind of a tough thing to think that uh, there could be this deep lamenting and weeping and there could be sorrow and anguish. And then it would make sense. It's hard to understand that all of a sudden Jesus would then say, but that sorrow will turn into joy. And he gives them an illustration for it. And so if you've been in a delivery room, you might have kind of like experienced this a little bit. Uh, our first child that you saw on the screen, that's Autumn. Uh, and so it took, uh, I don't know, like 24 hours, my wife would know, probably like the time and date, like amount of time that it took to give birth. You know, I obviously was not the one experiencing the deep sorrow and anguish of childbirth. I just was looking at my wife who was in a ton of pain, as well as thinking I'm going to lose my best friend. And I'm like, is my child going to be okay? You know, like there was just like a lot happening, a little bit of complications. You know, you hear people like, oh, it's so quick and easy. You're like, not our experience. It was pretty terrible. But, and I didn't even have a baby. So, you know, like that's, ladies are like, you didn't even do anything. I know. I didn't. I did not. I even got a little sleep too. You know, like that's, like I had it easy. So the, the truth is though, right? Like the moment that Autumn was born though, all of the pain and anguish and all the different things that we went through for those 24 hours, like they just stopped being thought about. And my wife got to hold her daughter, and she's crying and smiling and loving her daughter. I'm weeping, trying to make sure I get, a, like, at least one picture, you know, on my phone. And I, like, it is just this, like, amazing moment where sorrow turns into joy because a baby has been born into the world. Like, it doesn't make sense, but it happens. And in this moment, Jesus then says in verse 22, so also you have sorrow now. Like their friend is going to go be uh, tortured. He's going to have a mistrial. There's no justice for him. And not just that, he's going to then be led to be crucified. He's going to be killed and he's going to be buried. They are about to experience a bunch of anguish and sorrow because their friend is going to go through a very difficult moment. And not even that, they're going to leave him. They're going to scatter, and they're going to kind of potentially lose a little faith. And so there's going to be a lot of dark times ahead for the disciples, but he then says this, But I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. Can you imagine that moment, right? Like Jesus is the one who pursues them after the resurrection, right? Like he shows up inside the room. He's the one who appears to his disciples. He's the one who goes after them, and they see him and there is joy. Like, could you imagine that moment where you realize you saw your friend killed and now he stands before you resurrected? Like, there's no context here as they're hearing it, but the moment they experience it, there is great joy. And you might say, well, how do you know they had great joy? Well, guess what? They wrote a ton of the New Testament. And so the question would be is, what was their view of the cross? What was their view of the thing that brought them the most sorrow and anguish for a couple of days. So I, I, I would like to read the whole New Testament with you, <laughs> but I can't. So I'm going to read just a couple. So a couple passages of Scripture that I think helps shed light on what was their view of the cross. So Peter, after the day of Pentecost, the Spirit falls. Peter gives a sermon, and this is part of it. He says, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Peter's like, that's the resurrection. 
And then he says, or Paul says in Romans 5.10, Paul speaking about the cross, he says, for, for while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. He's not writing it in a sad way. He's writing it in a victorious way. He's like, you have been brought to God by the death of Christ Jesus. And then he continues, he says, but much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? Like Paul is saying, the death and resurrection of Christ is not only my reconciliation, but Jesus is able to then save me completely because he lives. And then Colossians 2, 13 and 14, he, he writes, Paul says, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Paul is writing that there is good news, that there is good news that you can't meet the legal requirement to be righteous. But Christ has died in your place so that you might have life in him and that you might be forgiven of your sins and those sins are nailed to the cross, he writes. So this, this source of deep sorrow has now turned into this source of everlasting joy that the death and resurrection of Christ is now not something they grieve, but it is something they celebrate, they are thankful for, and as the Spirit helps them to understand the full meaning of this, they then share it with the world as good news. And the last one is one of my favorites, 1 John 4.10. John, the writer of this gospel, is also the writer of this epistle, and he says this, "...in this is love." Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation or the wrath-bearing sacrifice for our sins. So now when John looks at the cross, what does he see? He doesn't see grief and sorrow. He sees the manifestation of God's amazing sacrificial love towards sinners in Christ Jesus. The question of how do they view the cross post-resurrection is they view it as a term or in terms of joy and thankfulness and the salvation that God is bringing. The question I have for you this morning sitting post-resurrection is how do you view the cross? Right? Like how do you view the cross? Is it a source of joy? Is it the thing that drives you to continue in moments of sorrow? Is the fact that Jesus died in your place, and is alive forevermore? Is it doing anything in here for you this morning? If it's not, that's okay. I'm going to pray for you. But I would also put before you that read the scriptures. Read them and let them come alive. Let them see and testify of the goodness of God and his amazing love for you. Because that's the view of the cross. There's now this, followers of Jesus now have this eternal, everlasting joy post-resurrection. And that's what Jesus is saying. As I was studying this, there's this phrase in verse 22 that I just can't get away from. He says, you will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. Like there's this security about the joy. Right? Like the resurrection doesn't mean that you are going to have no bad times anymore. The resurrection doesn't mean that, that all of a sudden everything's going to be okay. But the resurrection actually gives evidence to the fact that the kingdom has come and a new day is dawning and there is this new age and now we can have hope in the midst of our sorrow. You may have met people like this. People who have been through deep, dark times, but yet they have this abiding joy and secure joy that they just can't get rid of. Uh, there's a lady at our old church who served with us, uh, with my wife and I in our youth group. Her name was Vicki, and uh, she battled breast cancer. And we had a Sunday night service that I was involved in. And uh, at the time, uh, the kind of popular song to sing uh, for services was uh, the 10,000 Reasons song by Matt Redman. You guys know, like the bless the Lord, oh my soul, I'm not going to sing for you. You know, like that song. But Vicki uh, Vicky would come every Sunday night, and even when she was like battling chemo and doing, uh, or battling cancer and going through chemo and doing some of those things, she would be there. And she would be there. And, and there's this line in that Matt Redman song where he says, on that day when my strength is failing and the end draws near, and my time has come. We don't like to think about those things, but that song makes you think about it. He says, but still my soul will sing your praise unending 10,000 years and forevermore. And there is just this moment where I can picture when that song plays, I don't think about anything other than Vicky. 
And all I see is her in the back pew, hands raised, singing that song, Bless the Lord, O my soul, in the midst of sorrow, in the midst of some of the worst pain of her life. Her home life's not great. Like, life's not great for Vicky, but yet she's still praising God because Jesus is her joy. And there is just this thing about somehow sorrow and feeling the depths of sorrow, but then yet knowing the Lord through that suffering and sorrow allows us to experience the greatness and goodness of God and the, this depth of joy that we just wouldn't get any way else. And so Jesus says, you're going to have sorrow, but that sorrow will turn into joy when you see me after the resurrection. And his disciples don't have a clue, but it leads me to the second thing, that that in light of the resurrection, followers of Jesus have a sober view of reality. A sober view of reality. Sober just means like clear-headed, you know, clear-minded. Like if if we say we have a sober view of reality, we want to just have like what is reality? So if you kind of read, I'm not going to read the rest of of this passage, but but in this passage, I I don't know if you saw it, but like Jesus says, I'm going to talk to you a little more plainly. You know, like, hopefully you'll understand what I'm saying, because they haven't been getting it. And so then you're kind of at this point, like, well, do they get it? Will they get it? And then all of a sudden, I don't know what it was for them, where uh, all of a sudden Jesus says a couple things, and they're like, oh, we get it now. Like, I taught math for 14 years. One of my favorite things to ask kids was when they said they get it. I'm just like, are you saying that because you really get it, or are you saying that to get me to shut up? You know, like, you're just tired of hearing the teacher talk to you and, like, explain it to you. And that's, like, almost this, like, they don't get what Jesus is saying. They really, I mean, it's like in the death of Christ is the death of their understanding of the Messiah. Like, they just don't understand who Jesus really was and what he was coming to do. They couldn't. I mean, it's just hard to think, like, oh, this guy's going to rise from the dead forevermore three days later. Like, that's wild. And so uh, this part of kind of this section is they don't really understand reality, but for us, the reader, the death and resurrection of Christ is reality. It is not subjective. It is objective truth that we proclaim here every Sunday, and we are saying that the death and resurrection of Christ is reality. So we're going to play a game. We're going to read the Bible, and you're going to see what stands out to you as I read this one verse. And we'll see kind of like where you land on the optimist or pessimist scale. Okay, so verse 33 is what we're going to kind of where we're going to hang for a second. Verse 33, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world, in the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. If I were to ask you like, hey, what words stand out to you? We don't need to do it out here in this crowd. But like if I were to say what stands out to you, uh, if you were like me, the eternal optimist, uh, you'd be like, ooh, I love the stuff about peace. I like that thing about overcoming the world. The part about tribulation, maybe I just like cancel that. You know, like that doesn't have to be there. Like if, if you're the pessimist, maybe you're more on the lines of like, yeah, that's right, tribulation. It's coming. This world ain't getting any better. Like there's no peace. There's no hope. There's no, right? Like there's just neither of those two. You like, you don't agree. I, you could tell in the beginning of my time here on staff that uh, like people didn't know me. Um, because I am pretty much an optimist, and it's probably to a fault. Like, I'm the guy who doesn't want to go to the doctor, not because, like, doctors are bad. I just don't want to be told any bad news, you know, like uh, high cholesterol, bad blood pressure, you know, like that kind of stuff. Well, they asked me to do a podcast, and uh, Vicky and Mark asked me to do a podcast, and uh, it was about uh, talking to humans, if you've ever done that. My episode was on sadness and grief. (laughs) I avoid those two things like the plague. Okay, I try not to be sad or have grief. I, I really just don't. But there's this, there's this element where even that as the eternal optimist is not great. That's not reality. Like Jesus says, if you look at this passage right here, in the world you will have tribulation. There's this juxtaposition that happens between the world and followers of Jesus and Jesus throughout the ch- previous chapters that we've been in as Jesus has been talking to his disciples. He talks about the world in reality. He's like, this is the way it's going to be. The rule of the world is coming after me. I'm going to be betrayed. They're going to hate you, right? The world's going to hate you. Then they're going to offer you up as if they were doing service to God, but they're not, right? Like there's all these tough things that he talks about. There's going to be tribulation in the world. And if you're an eternal optimist like me, you kind of can realize that like, that doesn't make any sense. Suffering is going to happen in this world. 
But if you're a pessimist, and you're like, there's nothing good, there's no, nothing great, well, then that's also not in accord with Scripture, because then Jesus says, I've said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. Right? And, and as I was reminded this morning, that it, earlier he had said that he gives peace, and not like the world gives. That he's actually going to the cross to secure our peace with God. That, like, there's this tension between the two. I was talking about this with Luke, and he was sharing his thoughts with me. And so, I don't know, um, Luke's our senior pastor here. And uh, he, he said this, Jesus isn't a halfway point between optimism and pessimism. His knowledge of how deep sin really is makes him a full pessimist when it comes to humanity. But his knowledge of the Father makes him a full optimist when it comes to the kingdom coming on earth. And I love that because if you have two feet planted right here on this earth, then this statement is a fact. In this world, you will have trouble. Like you're not going to be able to avoid it. And even more so, if in this world you want to follow Jesus, then yes, you will definitely experience trouble and tribulation because the world is full of sin. But then I love that part that Jesus is a full optimist when he knows the Father's will of the coming of the kingdom. And he says, but take heart, I have overcome the world. The Apostle Paul kind of brings this out in Romans 8, in verse 18, he says this, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Right? Like Paul's holding both in tension. He's living in reality that as a follower of Jesus, he is experiencing suffering. Like we all are going to experience hardship and trial and suffering. But the overwhelming call of the New Testament is that we are to count it joy because there is something greater that is being produced in us and something greater that is awaiting us. That in the resurrection, in light of the resurrection, we can have a sober view of reality even when we're going through hard times. Not to avoid it or not to lean all the way on the other side and be totally pessimistic, but it is to then remember that we live in this age where things are being made new, but not everything is made new yet. Like we are coming to that day when Christ comes again. As we walk through suffering, then we remember that there will come a day when I'll see my Savior face to face. And that he will wipe away every tear. Right? He, there will be death no more. There will be no more pain. And there will be this call that in the end, he is making all things new. And we live in that reality. And the resurrection text testifies to it. And the third thing is this. In light of the resurrection... Followers of Jesus have a victory that provides strength to endure. There's a victory that prov is provided to us. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but I like math. Um, I know this kind of heavy math chat here for a second. Some people are like, don't start doing math. No, I won't. Um, but I, I, I did go to U of A. So always there. But uh, I did go to U of A and I, I took a math class. Um, so I just, uh, I, I wanted to tell you, I've failed a math course before. Yeah, yeah. I failed a math course. Uh, and, and it was Math 323, if anybody's ever taken it. Uh, I failed it. And I had to take it again because I was a math major. And you can't fail a math course and get like, you know. So I had to take it again. So I took it again the next semester. I literally had no clue what I was doing in the class. I really thought I did. Um, but then I just like, got an F on everything. Um, and uh, so I took it again. Same professor, but new people in the class. And one of the guys that was in the class was in my Bible study. And I knew he was like a smart guy, but I didn't know he was that smart. He turned out he ended up with a PhD in mathematics. Um, and uh, so the professor was like, hey, uh, we're going to change something up this semester. We're going to kind of do some group projects. I was like, ding, 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 ding. Like, that's it. I know who my partner is. And so it was Jacob. So I'm like the guy on like LeBron James or Michael Jordan's team. I'm like the 12th guy at the end of the bench, like the hype man, like, yes, let's go. I get a ring. You know, like I don't do anything <laughs> like that. That was me in this class. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's, that's it. Like Jacob helped me understand enough to get a C and that was victory for me. I'm like, let's go. Graduation. You know, like that's it. That is what Jesus is saying. When he says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. 
But take heart, I have overcome the world. The, the word overcome is in this beautiful Greek tense uh, called the perfect tense, which means that it has happened. Jesus has overcome the world, but it has eternal consequences for you and for me and for all who put their faith in Christ. That we now overcome the world, not by what we have done, but by what he has done. Look at where this falls. Look at where this falls. He, he, he tells them like, oh, you guys believe now? Let me tell you, you don't believe. And here's what's going to happen. You're all going to scatter. You're all going to leave me. And I'm not alone, but the Father's with me. Right? Like that's what he tells them. And then the very next thing is he tells them, I have overcome the world. So in spite of their failure to follow faithfully, in spite of their failure to go to the cross with him, in spite of all of that, Jesus says, I have overcome the world. And essentially, you're overcoming with me. You're on my team. John says it this way a little bit. In 1 John 5, verses 4 through 5, he says, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. It's our faith. He says, Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. If I were to ask you this morning, like, how are you overcoming? Where, where do you find victory? Where do you search for the strength to prevail? Where do you look for things to help you overcome? If it's outside of Christ, we are not then kind of utilizing the resources that God has given us. Right? He's provided strength in his victory. John says that it's our faith that overcomes the world. And then he goes a step further. It's your faith in Christ. And this is the whole reason that John is writing this. That if you're sitting here this morning, the reason this whole book of the Bible is written is so that you might know that Jesus is the Son of God. That you might know that he died and he rose on your behalf. That you might know that Christ lives and that in him you can overcome and have life. He says that it's faith in him, not your works, not anything that you've done, not your amount of suffering. It's his suffering and his faithfulness to the Father and his work on the cross and his resurrection. And I say that to you if you're not a Christian, but I say it to you if you are a Christian. Like, how are you overcoming? Like, are you kind of just going on fumes? Have you looked at the cross lately? Have you thought soberly about reality as Scripture portrays it? And have you kind of sat with this beautiful truth that Jesus loves you and he came for you and you're on his team and there's victory? That's reality. And so the last question I just want to ask is like, why is all of this written? Like, what's the point? What's the point of writing this whole passage and, and saying that? It seems kind of a weird place to put it, right? Like, I have overcome the world, and what happens next? He dies. It's weird to everybody in that moment. But to us reading, we're like, yeah, that's right. There's joy. So why is this written? This is written so that we might endure, right? These words are not written so that we can just sit and nod our head and be like, yes, those are great truths. Let's sing another song. Those Truths are written, and these words are written for us by John to tell us to keep following Christ. Seth said a couple weeks ago, and I love it, he said the Holy Spirit gives us grit so that we might not be whiners, but that we might be witnesses to the good news of the gospel. Right? And Luke said it last week that the Holy Spirit gives us soft hearts and steel spines. I don't know if you're sensing a theme in these final words of Christ before he goes to the cross, but they are words of encouragement to tell his people that as things get worse, keep going. Keep following me. Even at cost to yourselves, there will be a cost. There will be difficulty as you follow Jesus, but it's worth it. Keep going. That's why these words are written to give us strength in the midst of hard times, to help us endure and persevere. I think of, first, or I think of uh, Hebrews chapter 12, where he says, right, since you're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, he says, run the race with endurance. 
But then what does he say? He says, looking to Jesus, right? Look to the Lord. Look to all of his goodness and grace and look to him as our example because for the joy set before him, for the reward that he was going to obtain, for the salvation of many sinners and the glorifying of God, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and in victory he sat down at the right hand of God. And then he says, come follow me. That's why these words are written for us today. So let's keep following Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for the words of Christ. I pray that we would be a faithful people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Even if it comes at great cost to us, I pray that we would bring honor and glory to the one and only name, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.